Okay. Um, I can hear you. Now? Yeah, Great. yeah. Okay. I don't have my camera, but I can hear you. No problem. Do you want to? Could you make me co-host and pause the yep. recording for now? Thanks. Is it okay? Mandeep, mm -hmm. Mandeep, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm very sorry, much just before you start, Mandeep, just to let you know that everyone that we have um, translation available, the translators could come in and explain that briefly. That would be great. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, so sorry, Mandeep. Yes, there are uh, translations available in English, French, and Spanish. So if you have any issues, you can, I mean, you can, you can switch on to um, uh, your respective languages in the interpretation uh, button. Um, yeah, am I clear? And if it's clear, then um, we'll move to very quickly to Mandeep. Mandeep, please. <laughs> Thank you, Jyotsna, and, and great to connect with you and, uh, and, and, and to see that you are chairing this important conversation. Uh, I also want to thank our partners, Forus and CPDE, uh, in this important discussion. Uh, this year's General Assembly really is, you know, held in the shadow of, uh, of 20 years of 9-11, uh, which was a watershed event. As, You're in the English channel, Hector. Okay. Sorry, continue. No problem. So, so this year's um, General Assembly session is, you know, is, is also marking 20 years of 9-11. And 9-11 was a watershed moment for human rights and civic space issues. In fact, it was after 9-11 that, you know, we found that for the first time in the post-Second World War scenario that in the decades that followed, we actually saw a regression in human rights and civic space standards. If I may say that in, in, the, first, uh, in, the, in the first five decades following the Second World War, we actually made progress on civic space and, you know, and, and, and human rights principles. But after 9-11, what happened was that we saw a regression where public safety and security matters came uh, very much head to head with our long cherished civil liberties and and many many challenges took place one democratic countries that had been steadfast supporters of human rights and democratic values themselves lowered their own standards. erosion of rights and three key issues that that were that were absolutely critical from a 9 11 perspective was that torture became normalized enforced disappearance started to happen on a, on, a, on a huge scale and extrajudicial ex executions and through drone attacks and, 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 and bombings became somewhat uh, common, commonplace in, in the so-called war against terror. Now this led to a real regression in human rights standards. Civil society had fought long and hard to ensure the right to a fair trial, to ensure due process of law. And this had a devastating impact. This year's General Assembly session is also being held in, in the shadow of another major earth shattering event, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. In the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen similar challenges, of course, not at the, not at the same level as 9-11, but many governments have had to put in place emergency measures in relation to COVID-19. And three issues have emerged in our work at Civicus uh, as in relation to how governments have responded to COVID-19. These are, there's an increase in censorship as we saw uh, as, the COVID-19 pandemic hit our societies. Many governments and leaders started to put in place restrictions on information because they wanted to put their best foot forward. So there was censorship on public information. Those who were critical of the official responses began to be persecuted. We also found that, that in the name of contact tracing, in the name of, of controlling spread of the disease, there was an increase in overarching surveillance. Apps were, were put together so that people can... Uh, can be monitored uh, in, in to, to prevent the spread of the disease, but these, but these surveillance capacities have far-reaching cap uh, capabilities which could impact the exercise of civic freedoms beyond 
the, uh, the, the, the emergency created by the pandemic. And in relation to the pandemic, we also found that several law enforcement agencies were given coercive powers to impose curfews and lockdowns, which is again going to be a quality of, of, uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And just as, as 9-11 impacts continue to, continue to affect us in negative ways, we have to be very careful as civil society that we need to ensure that government responses are proportionate, they are necessary, and any emergency measures must exist only till the pendency of the emergency and they're not repurposed to ensure uh, coercive control or any authoritarian um, rule uh, by leaders, both in democracies and, 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 in, you know, and, and in other countries where democracy is, is still a work in progress. Now, even as governments fail the pandemic test in relation to COVID-19, in our research at Civicus, we found that CSOs really rose to the occasion. Civil society organizations that promote human rights and social justice values provided support to communities at risk on the ground. Many of them also uh, helped uh, staff domestic violence helplines. They also helped provide credible information on how to spread in uh, the the, uh, the how to how to how to uh, control the spread of the disease. This was absolutely critical. And despite all of these uh, supports by civil society, civic space still remains constrained, but protests have also continued. So civil society, despite the pandemic, despite all the constraints, continued to highlight government failures in many, many countries. In Brazil, innovative uh, uh, mobilization was carried out by putting crosses in front of government hospitals to highlight failure of the government response. We found across the world, there was an outpouring of indignation at racism and racial injustice uh, through the Black Lives Matter protests, which of course, uh, uh, you know, started in the United States, but, but were also uh, taken up in many other parts of the world. We've also found that work on environmental justice continued in countries like Kenya and elsewhere, uh, and also on women's sexual and reproductive rights. There were con people continued to mobilize and, 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 and demand Better, uh, uh, better protections in, in countries like Argentina and in Poland. And more importantly, in Chile, this, through public mobilization, a constitutional convention was created, which is gender equal, which includes indigenous people's representation. It, it, it continues to be a work in progress, but, it, but, it, but an important uh, precedent was set through it. And also in Costa Rica, same-sex marriage was legalized. So civil society mobilizations and civic spaces continued, even though the conditions remain very, very challenging. According to our research at Civicus, through the Civicus Monitor, which is a participatory platform that measures conditions for global civic freedoms, uh, less than 4% of the world's population actually live in countries where the freedoms of peaceful assembly, expression, and association are fully respected in accordance with international law standards and in accordance with the constitutions of most countries. This remains a huge challenge. And especially as uh, it's not just state actors, but also non-state actors that continue to attack civil society. And, and as we have witnessed recently in Afghanistan and, and, and elsewhere, so which remain huge challenges for us. So I'd just like to you know, conclude that you know, over the years, the right to peaceful assembly is something that, that has been a really important right for civil society and peaceful assembly, both online, both offline, has been critical for civil society to be able to get the change uh, in, in the post-Second World War period when the international human rights framework was developed, whether it's been through decolonization struggles in Africa, whether it's been through the civil rights struggles uh, in, many, in, in North America and elsewhere, whether it's the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, gender justice struggles around the world, and also to highlight the climate emergency, which young people have done in many parts of the world. And the right to peaceful assembly remains a very important right, yet it remains extremely challenged because dictators, authoritarian leaders who don't believe in democratic values are most afraid of people's mobilizations on the street. And they continue to criminalize uh, protest leaders, protest organizers, and all sorts of security legislation continues to be used against them that we need to, we need to highlight uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and stand up against. We also need to push democratic states to defend democratic freedoms, to, to defend constitutional rights, 
Unfortunately, because of the crisis of multilateralism over the past five or six years, uh, what has happened is the appetite of many democratic states has decreased. And this uh, to defend uh, human rights values on the global stage. And this is again somewhere uh, a place that we really need to work with democratic states to help them shore up the scaffolding of democratic rights and freedoms. And we in civil society also need to continue to do more to defend the, our civic freedoms and work in solidarity with each other across borders. So let me stop here and uh, just want to emphasize that rights online and rights offline are, are equally important and we need to continue to work towards them. It's integral to our work on poverty alleviation. It's uh, integral to our work on gender justice. Uh, it's integral to our work on uh, climate justice, integral to our work on democratic rights and civic space and freedoms are, are so intrinsically linked to our work that we need to continue to work with all stakeholders to ensure that there is proper respect uh, for the right to democratic dissent and for civil society organizations to speak out, organize and communicate with each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mandeep, for sticking with the time and your very, very powerful uh, speech, uh, especially uh, how we need to ensure our rights and uh, we need to uh, ensure our uh, right to freedom of expression, uh, both online and off in both uh, spaces. Um, and you spoke very well, uh, you know, how there has been various challenges that the civil society is facing, despite all the support given by the civil society, especially during the time of pandemics, um, but still our spaces are being challenged uh, by by, by the government, by other stakeholders. And um, we have seen, I mean, I mean, I belong to, I am from Asia and we have seen such serious issues just coming up in Myanmar uh, that happened in, uh, you know, uh, February 1st, the military coup and later in Afghanistan, our region is at turmoil. So I think it's very, very important for all of us to stay together, to stay in solidarity and make sure that our voices are heard. And uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, uh, our recommendations and our our visions would be heard during this uh, Global People's Assembly and during the UNGA. So with this, I move to our uh, second speaker of the, of the session. Um, uh, her name is, she's from, uh, please uh, excuse me for if there's some, uh, if I'm not able to pronounce your name, but uh, if um, uh, her name is Biljana Spasu. Almost. Biliana. Uh, okay, we call. Okay, hi, Biliana. Thank you so much. Uh, Biliana is from CPD. She's a regional coordinator for Europe and executive director of Balkan Civil Society Network for Development. And Biliana, thank you so much for being here. And you're going to speak on, uh, you're going to make an overview of um, civic space and human rights from the, uh, from the Balkans. And you have about 15 minutes to speak. Um, the floor is yours, Biliana. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much and thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, being here actually, even virtually again. <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's make most of it. I will thank Mandeep for uh, uh, placing such a nice global picture and I will just uh, maybe go into a deep uh, into the details of the into the details of the Balkan region, which because it's not a terminalist region, it's not often talked about, but uh, the, space, the civic space is significantly narrowing down and uh, the pandemic has even uh, uh, strengthened this trend, uh, this trend of narrowing down the civic space all across the region. So uh, for the past couple of years, the restrictions to basic rights and fundamental freedom have increased, especially uh, uh, in regards uh, freedom of expression with uh, uh, strength, uh, even stronger media campaigns and attack on civic activists and specifically on journalists all across the region. Uh, freedom of assembly has, of course, as everywhere, uh, been heavily restricted during, during the pandemic, but also there were numerous cases of uh, the excessive use of force. Uh, although the citizens and the civil society organizations and civil society activists have found uh, very innovative ways of protesting despite the restrictions being in place. For example, there a famous uh, banging pet, uh, pots on the terraces uh, was in Kosovo uh, as, a, um, as a demonstration of uh, peace of assembly and, and protesting against the government. 
And then also we want the freedom of association, uh, association face significant challenges because of the closed institutions and inability of organizations to register. And on the other hand, significant rise of the uh, government or party uh, initiated organizations which uh, disrupted the civic space or at least the liberal, the liberal civil, civic space and then undermine the, the trust in the overall civil society by the citizens. Uh, there is a, a big negative trend when it comes to regulations of anti-money laundering and, uh, counterfeiting, and uh, uh, counterfeiting terrorism that the government have imposed here or use it as a lever, as an excuse to restrict further the organizations, the, uh, the operation of the civil society organizations, and it's becoming a big issue uh, across the region. Um, civil society has been pushed a lot uh, in the dialogue between with the public institutions. Again, the COVID has been a, uh, the COVID measures have been uh, an excuse. Uh, this gap to further incre uh, in, uh, increase. And on the other hand, the funding, as probably in most regions, have significantly decreased due to uh, decrease of uh, public funding, delayed processes, uh, decrease of donor funding. And uh, with that has uh, declined the, tr the trust in the public funding mechanism, both by the civil society organizations and, uh, and the citizens. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as everywhere, there was the big bang of the digital civic space. So this has brought the good and the bad. The good has been increased visibility of the civil society organizations. They have been able to adjust their operations and help uh, their constituencies and serve the vulnerable groups by uh, delivering services online. Uh, there was increase in the collaboration. Uh, so this, the world became a very narrow space where everybody could collaborate very quickly. And of course, the increase of the digital um, and direct democracy and then direct engagement of the citizens. However, uh, there was also the bad side of it. So the, there was increasing digital literacy gap where um, many citizens and even organizations were left out of this new space created. There was a significant detachment from the constituencies of those who uh, suffer from the, this digital gap and also organizations not being able to serve and to uh, approach those who are not uh, wired online. And then their lack of regulation actually created a huge space for the spread of fake news and even intensifying the smear campaigns against the civil society organizations, the civic activists, especially human rights activists as well. On the other hand, uh, the thing that we don't talk much was the burnout uh, causing by the increased and very intensive engagement uh, as the civil society organizations and activists, we actually feed from the passion of other people who are uh, joining forces and who are driving this change. And uh, the digital civic space and the civic engagement only online has sort of exhausted this passion and this uh, mm, disjoint efforts, let's say, that we saw the previous years of how we are going to change the world. So in this sense, I will uh, reflect on, I will actually address how we can take on these lessons learned uh, in order to, uh, how we can respond to the civic space threat so the first thing that comes to my mind is that we have to take digitalization seri seriously and whatever we do, as Madrid said, digital rights are civic rights and we have to uh, channel our operations appropriate to the digital world we are uh, in now. Uh, we were pushed to catch up quickly with the digital tools, no, tools during the pandemic. We transferred our advocacy line, we did amazing things. Uh, we uh, even explored plenty of possibilities for capacity building of the opportunities offered online. However, much of this has been done in crisis mode and we haven't had a chance to capitalize on this. So we need to think of ways how we can systematically work on all of our missions and goals uh, through the digital agenda. And then we were mainly focused on working with like-minded like organizations or, or servicing our citizens and constituencies. However, I think the majority of CSOs did not have a chance to think about the, the uh, challenges posed and the threats caused by the digital uh, space being opened up from to the illiberal uh, civil society, if we can name it. Uh, so uh, the 
fake news, the smear campaigns, and the aggressive campaigns against uh, liberal values is everything that we have to have in mind when we are addressing the, the, when we are uh, fighting for our civic space now. And this will include uh, raising awareness. Uh, about the enabling environment. So we have to also channel the importance of having in place this set of rules for operating freely also online. Uh, we have to fight for the civic space, not only in terms of uh, being uh, uh, unrestricted, but also in terms of uh, regulating it consciously so it doesn't fire back on our uh, uh, key values. On the other hand, we also need to use more effectively the digital space to be more accountable. So uh, in fighting, while we fight with the outside environment, we have to take a moment to improve ourselves from within. So we must emphasize the uh, importance of the civil society being uh, more, uh, be, uh, more um, driven by our constituencies we have to reach out more frequently more systematically more more often how we can serve them best and not only understand accountability on its basic mean as a transparency or a general accountability just towards our donors or our uh, primary stakeholders uh the uh, i yeah i have few more points so diversify funding uh, the, the diversifying funding in times when uh, funding for civil society is uh, especially uh, narrowing, we have to think of ways how we can uh, use this digital, uh, new created digital space for diversifying our funding base. So this can mean mobilizing new resources of spy, um, or combining resources for, with other organizations or uh, thinking of innovative approach for crowdfunding or fundraising. Uh, this is something that we have to uh, uh, think upfront because uh, the new trends are not looking much forward. Uh, the, th the fourth one we want to say is that we need to leverage more the international uh, on the international pressure. What we are doing now, uh, um, spreading the word, uh, raising awareness, communicating and collaborating with each other, but also pointing pressure on the international institutions is something we need to continue and think of new ways how this digital, uh, new digital space can actually fit and uh, strengthen our work in this area. Building coalitions and partnerships. Uh, thankfully, this new era has been uh, very much helpful in terms of uh, creating new partnerships or strengthening the old one. And it, I, speaking from our experience as well, this has been helpful so much. So part of the, uh, but even before, uh, for example, the action that was uh, created uh, by CPD, by, uh, by Civico jointly, for example, which was the Belgrade Call for Action, was taken very seriously and upon by several organizations. And also the example of how the civil society mobilized, for example, for uh, contributing to specific documents targeting the civic space and enabling environment for the civil society. And lastly, uh, we also need to, well, last two. Uh, the first one is get citizens on board more, meaning we have to communicate better with them. Uh, we have been accused of being detached from uh, citizens, maybe too much or not communicating well our work. This has to improve and we need to explore the new digital space also for this area. Our work has to be more value of more visible to the citizens so they know and understand the value of the civil society better. And lastly, we also need to work more with donors and call out on donors or how they are shaping the civil society as well. They have their role, their role and responsibilities in how they're creating the support for civil society, how they are communicating and how they're cooperating, whether it's for involving in the processes of preparing the support whether it's for their approach to uh, this power shift and turning the power in the, towards the citizens, uh, donors also hold a responsibility and we, we need and have to work more closely with them as much as we try to work with our government. So I think this is it for me. I hope I was not speaking too fast. And yeah, basically, thank you very much.
Thank you so much. Um, you made some very, very important points, um, especially about, um, you know, how can we make use of this digital space, uh, especially, you know, diversifying the funding, because definitely funding is one of the issues that it comes from everywhere. Apart from shrinking civic space, the one thing I mean, we have seen during the pandemic that many, many civil societies were, uh, uh, they had to close down. They had to close the operations. Uh, so I think it's very important to how can we forge new partnership and uh, how can we work with the donors and other uh, other agencies because uh, the role of donor is also very important and it has to move beyond the, the donor and the recipient uh, mode to, to us more the partnership you know, values because uh, it's not about only taking funds from the donor, but then we are also sharing a lot of skills our knowledge and experiences from, you know, from the work. And the second thing that how can, uh, I mean, I completely agree with you. Sometimes somewhere the civil societies, we are accused of distancing ourselves from the citizens. So how can we make the, that space very stronger and make our work very visible? So thank you so much. This is, they are very important points. And um, with this, I, I move now to our third speakers, uh, which, um, uh, which would be, you know, uh, which would be like subdivided. There would be two speakers uh, from uh, uh, this, uh, the last one, uh, last uh, number of speakers, which would be uh, between Deirdre and Bibi. So they are going to speak on uh, the challenge of creating an innovating digital environment for civil society. Uh, so it would be about of 15 minutes, but I request Deirdre if she could um, make her speech and she can limit herself within seven minutes and then Bibi who takes over and she talks about the innovative global civil society campaign on civic space and human rights. So Deirdre, uh, now the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks very much, Jasna, and thanks for the, the kind introduction. So um, Forest is going to present now some of its work on uh, civic space and particularly on the issue of an enabling digital environment for civil society. So I'd like to ask my colleague, Laura, could she share her screen so that you can see my PowerPoint presentation? So as, as uh, Jasna said, I'll speak for the first seven minutes and just outline some of the advocacy work that Forest has done in the area of creating a more enabling digital environment for civil society globally. And and then my colleague Bibi will come in and talk about some of our communications campaigns in this area. So for Forest, we work a lot. We're a global civil society network. We have members across 68 national development platforms across 68 countries and seven regional coalitions. And for us, it's extremely important as we look at how civic space is, is becoming increasingly constrained and limited for civil society, that we give enough attention to the issue of digital space because more and more we're connecting with each other um, transnationally or internationally, as well as uh, at a domestic level, uh, but using digital means. And we're connecting with our members and partners in remote rural areas and so on, increasingly where there, it's available by digital means. So it is very important in an age when we're talking about strengthening multilateralism and, and global governance and trying to you know, reform the UN and make it more responsive and, and, and for civil society to be able to engage better with it, that we're able to do this uh, using digital space that gives us the kind of freedom to operate that we have experienced, um, you know, physically in, you know, in the work we've been doing to date. So what we say in Forus is, you know, uh, no digital space without civic space. It's really important that we protect our civic space as we move online. So first uh, slide, please, um, Laura. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our advocacy work on this area. So we believe that this accelerating global process of digitalization is very quickly changing the operating space of civil society everywhere. And we agree with the last speaker from CPDE that while digital technologies do provide civil society with new ways to engage their, their to express their freedoms of association, assembly and expression, they're at the same time providing governments and others, and sometimes these are other liberal NGOs or they may be the private sector or whatever, with new ways of restricting those rights. And it does raise questions about how these kind of technological advances are going to affect an already shrinking civic space for civil society globally. So as different digital technologies become more powerful and their use is increasingly widespread, and we all know that we use 
uh, many of us, are, you know, digital means for, for an awful lot of different aspects of our lives. So, but as this intensifies, as this process intensifies, the digital divide intensifies also. And that is the divide between those who have access and so the stark inequalities that we are seeing now between those who can access and use digital technologies and those who can't. And it's a stark fact, but half of the world's population is not yet digital, digitally connected. And as a direct result, many people are likely to experience social and economic exclusion as a result. Next slide, please, um, Laura. So what are the issues around digitalization? Well, the key issues for us are firstly, the lack of adequate regulation of the digital space, and also the absence of democratic governance of digitalization around the globe, that it has the potential to significantly undermine rather than advance civic space, human welfare, freedom, dignity, and justice everywhere. So as governments and societies increasingly embrace transformative digital technologies, and as key policy and decision-making process move online, and we're seeing that happen more and more, it is critical that the process of digitalization actually serves to expand rather than to shrink our civic space. And this is the civic space that's necessary for CSOs to be able to operate effectively. So the guarantee of a well-regulated and a democratic digital space is essential to promote the functioning of healthy civil society. Next slide, please. So Forrest recently produced a report, just want to draw your attention to it, called Towards an Enabling Digital Environment for Civil Society, and you'll find that on our website. And in it, we make a range of recommendations to governments, to the international community and so on, about what needs to happen to achieve a more enabling environment for civil society globally. I'm going to share some of these recommendations with you now. So the key report recommendations start with the issue of digital inclusion, and we call for governments and the international community to act quickly to ensure the digital inclusion of all, and particularly of low income and socially excluded demographic groups. Another recommendation is that governments should develop enabling legislative flame frameworks for the new digital age. And this will include progressive policies on cybersecurity, on privacy, on accessibility, on inclusion, and on data ownership. Thirdly, and this is importantly and builds on what Mandeep said earlier, governments, civil society and business should recommit to human rights conventions in the digital era. And we need to work together to implement and monitor the impact of digital policies of access to the internet and to ensure progressive rights first digital usage. The next recommendation we made was that support should be provided to civil society to enable it to develop important strategic partnerships. And these partnerships would be with governments, with international organizations, with donors, with private sector organizations, with tech for good NGOs and with others to promote cross-sectoral cooperation so that the, the collective benefits of digitalization can be realized for all and the risks can be minimized. Next uh, slide, please, Laura. Uh, further recommendations included that governments should ensure transparent, accountable and inclusive governance of the digital sphere. And we believe there's an urgent need for a fundamental shift away from the status quo where control lies in the hands of a number of large private tech companies. And we need to move towards a more multi-stakeholder model of governance in which civil society can play an integral role. And another recommendation we made was directed at the international community, and that was that it should urgently develop a strategic framework that will link closing civic space, including in the digital realm, to other key foreign policy challenges. And this would mean that this framework would be uh, about articulating a very positive vision of civic space globally, and the tailored advice could be provided to governments, to civil society actors, and to other interested stakeholders. Um, including advice from experts who could be brought on board to help us to understand how the rapidly evolving digital landscape um, is, is, is impacting on our work and to make the connection with civic space uh, issues, including to future threats. So we see this as a really important idea, um, uh, an international initiative to really make sure that the kind of digitalization that's going to happen that will hopefully be rolled out and include the, all of the world's population eventually, including the half that's not digitally connected at the moment, but that it is promoting the way in which that digitalization works promotes 
human rights, civic space and democracy. And that can't be taken for granted. So it's important that civil society mobilizes around this issue and really pushes to see that kind of digitalization happening. Next slide, please, Laura. So this is just, thank you very much for your attention. There's a link there to our forest report, or you can find it on our forest website. The address is there. And if you have any queries, please contact me at the email address you see uh, on the slide. Thanks very much for your attention. I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Bibi Abruzzi, who's going to talk about our communications work in this area. So over to you, Bibi. Thank you so much, Deidre. And as Deidre explained, we're going to uh, showcase a little bit the idea behind the Let's Talk Digital Collective campaign. But first, I would like to ask Rose, if possible, to share the video. Uh, that is the trailer of the podcast that we have produced with activists as part of this uh, campaign. You let me know if it's possible. If not, uh, we can I, I skip can it. do it. I, I'm doing it now. Thank you so much. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah, okay. thank you so much. Cultura en Centroamérica por su ubicación geográfica que cada vez ha experimentado mayores situaciones de desastre. En fin, para que me escuche, es rien que ça, c'est énorme. De moins, avant, je n'étais pas un féministe parce que je voyais que comme un seul féministe assez homogène qui des fois à l'encontre de ce que je pensais, de mes valeurs et autres. Alors que là, j'ai l'impression qu'il y a la possibilité de le modeler et ça se l'approprier pour chaque femme. I mean, after the Arab Spring in 2011, in 2012-13, we started witnessing the counter-revolution everywhere. So everywhere, they wanted to, let's say, stop this process and try to protect the interests of the people in power. Una de las cosas que nosotros hacemos como colectivo ¿no? es interpelar al sistema patriarcal, colonial, capitalista. Queremos generar un desmonte ahí. ¿no? Estamos conscientes que somos la última generación ¿no? para eh, generar cambios reales y dejar de, eh, bueno, y tratar de evitar mayores catástrofes, mayores crisis y sobre todo una crisis climática. Irrespective of our sexual orientation, gender identity or sex characteristics, we should have this humanity at the forefront of our social acceptance and tolerance. Like I said earlier, be indifferent to difference. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing uh, the video. So this is just uh, an example of how we're trying to use a bit the multimedia uh, format to trigger a conversation about uh, civic space and especially about uh, um, digitalization. And I think somebody in the comments, uh, Maria, I think said that economic and social rights together with, with environmental justice have to be added in this conversation. And I think, yes, that as a network, at first we totally agree we cannot talk uh, about digitalization if we do not talk about for example climate justice or how we can use digitalization processes to build resilient communities or for example how digitalization intersects with gender we can see that in the tech uh, industry uh, it's still not uh, totally balanced uh, in terms of participation uh, of gender and the social and economic backgrounds. So we have experimented with the format of a podcast to collaborate with people from around the world during the pandemic, because obviously we cannot go and have meetings or a film uh, activists or civil society organizations. So we thought, uh, let's remember our punk, uh, let's say, backgrounds and uh, DIY sort of uh, concept and the experiment with podcasts that we recorded uh, via Zoom. Uh, so it was very low cost accessible uh, technology that allowed us to have a very rich uh, conversations with activists, grassroots movements and civil society organizations from over uh, 20 countries on uh, topics such as uh, digitalization, civic space, human rights, uh, etc. So I would like to share my screen just for two seconds. Voila, here it is. Sorry, you probably see yourselves right now. Oops. Yes, excuse me. Voila, 
to talk just very briefly about why we started the Let's Talk Digital campaign. I think as Deidre and all the other speakers explained, we have witnessed this big bang of uh, digital civic space. So uh, the main questions uh, that uh, arose uh, in the network uh, of civil society organizations that we collaborate and work with is, are we actually involved in the digitalization process? Of course, as citizens, uh, we all are, but are we just consumers or can we actually shape this process? So this is really what has uh, driven uh, our communication uh, campaign, Let's Talk Digital. So so uh, basically we wanted to engage with this concept uh, more critically, so sharing our fears, but also our digital matrix uh, dreams, if we can call uh, them like that. So, for instance, uh, through some participative uh, workshops, uh, uh, some uh, an activist uh, from uh, Cape Verde told us, I think that uh, the internet and digitalization doesn't have the word inclusion in its DNA. However, uh, uh, civil society organizations from Taiwan uh, told us exactly the opposite. So the idea is really to engage in conversations where we don't necessarily have to agree on everything that digitalization means, but uh, the idea through Let's Talk Digital is uh, exactly as the title suggests to talk about it. And um, finally, uh, we had uh, a lot of guiding uh, questions uh, such as, who should decide uh, on the future of the internet? What about artificial intelligence? Uh, is an algorithm neutral enough or dangerous uh, for uh, the future of us as a society? And then uh, how can we talk together about this and find the new narratives? And uh, finally, can we actually own digitalization, um, uh, the digitalization process? And uh, I think that the last question that really drives uh, the campaign and that we would love to hear from you and uh, activists and other networks is what will the future of protest and of civic space look like? So um, there are several ways in which uh, uh, we are building uh, this campaign. So mostly it's through interviews, interviews with activists, with uh, forest members and with other civil society networks. Then is via uh, participative workshops in which usually we have an activist or even a citizen uh, talking uh, together with members from all over the globe and uh, basically debating uh, old school debates about what digitalization means. And uh, finally, as I was showing, we have the Space for Us uh, podcast. Uh, which you can find on the website with uh, several um, episodes on digitalization in different languages to try and represent uh, the diversity of our network. So the episodes are in English, French, and Espanol. Um, and uh, well, I don't think I can go back to, uh, to the screen. Excuse me for this. Um, voila. And then finally, I just want to share with you a last slide about how you can um, uh, participate. Uh, so uh, there's also going to be some uh, um, micro surveys that we're going to launch in the next days uh, so that uh, you can all share your story through a Google form or uh, you can contact us if you have ideas or if your organization is doing something uh, specific. Uh, uh, on this topic, uh, and uh, or if you think uh, that there are intersections with what your organization is doing, for instance, on gender and the topic of uh, 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 digitalization. And uh, yes, finally, we're looking forward to also collecting data uh, because uh, yes, it's extremely important also to build a common position on what it means uh, to be in this digitalization uh, dream or nightmare, depending on, uh, on uh, your situation. And and uh, voila, we're looking forward uh, to hearing from you and uh, to sharing ideas all together on this. Uh, thank you so much. Wow, thank you, Bibi. Very inspiring. I know one, I'm one of those uh, partners. We have been interacting um, a lot and um, sometimes it just goes beyond the head what you're talking, but uh, it makes a lot of sense actually. So thank you so much, Bibi and Deirdre, for your very, very nice presentation. And um, 
where we saw that Deirdre, she made a presentation on the digital enabling environment that was produced by uh, for us and uh, which was uh, she has made some uh, some uh, recommendations that has come up uh, from this uh, um, from this uh, study and uh, some of the recommendations that Deirdre uh, she suggested was uh, how the government and the international uh, community should act quickly to ensure the digital inclusion of all uh, developing enabling legislative framework, uh, recommit to human rights conventions, uh, develop important strategic partnership with government, international organization, donors that we are hearing uh, from many of you that uh, how needs, how it's so important for us to forge partnership with, you know, uh, to make a, a multi-stakeholder partnership because uh, it's not uh, very fair to just speak just within our civil society group, but until we reach out to them and we discuss our issues uh, and we forge uh, this kind of uh, partnership uh, definitely we are going to reach uh, a new level um, uh, there are some other recommendations that DHA, uh, uh, and the, the, the report suggested about the government and the um, uh, international community should act quickly to ensure the digital inclusion of all then develop a uh, enabling legislative framework and um, develop important strategic partnership uh, you know so these are uh, apart from that, we have heard from Bibi uh, how uh, Forest is working on podcast, and um, they have been they have reached to about uh, twenty countries, and they have been talking to activists, um, you know, and um, more than anything, why we need to go digital because um, are we part of the whole process of digitalization? Are we consumers, or we can shape the whole process? I think these are some of the very important questions that we really need to introspect. Um, how we want to engage in this whole concept of digitalization very critically. Um, uh, this may not very. This may uh, sound may not sound. You know, uh, we may not need to agree with everything and everyone that is being proposed. But at least we have the liberty to discuss with each other. And uh, also, you know, who will decide the future of internet or artificial intelligence in the future? You know, what will be the future of the protest look like? Uh, how can we participate and there are some uh, so you can actually you can get in touch with forests and how they are coming up with their micro surveys and how can we be part of the storytelling process and how can you make this whole process of digitization more effective so with that um i would uh, thank you uh bibi and deirdre for your very very nice presentation and with this uh, we move to the second segment of our um of our whole discussion which would be the uh, we know we are expecting a lot of questions and uh, I see there are lots of, uh, uh, you know, conversation happening in the chat box, but I would just like to, uh, you know, uh, uh, highlight some of the questions that you can discuss, you can ask your, ask the presenters, uh, ask the presenters, and some of the questions uh, would be like, uh, what can the government, civil societies, the private sector do to better defend and promote civic space and human rights globally? And how can these actors ensure that digitalization does not reduce, but rather expand civic space online? So these are some of the questions that you can deliberate and you can ask, uh, you know, you can ask uh, questions to the speakers. And uh, for your convenience, I can, uh, uh, if it's not put here, I can put here in the chat box. So you can um, um, ask everyone, you can ask the presenter. So these are the questions. And with that, I would like to, you know, ask uh, if you have questions, concerns, any stories that you want to highlight, please, uh, you can raise your hand and uh, we'll try to hear all of you. Maybe I, want, uh, I wonder would the person who put the comment on economic and social rights and environmental justice in the chat box would they like to expand a little on that point or yeah maria hi yes uh, thank you well i think it was kind of already touched in previous presentation in terms like how um 
access or how respect to economic and social right actually influence and shape all these divides in a society and how that then backfires or not in terms in uh, both online and offline space. But um, so it's not just... Um, my point was that uh, I would like to see like this totality of human rights uh, discussed so we can better understand what access to both um, digital space and uh, physical space for gathering, for expression, for fighting and claiming all our rights actually mean. And in terms of en environmental justice, I, ha I think it's uh, it has two levels. First, uh, related to the digitalization itself, we need to take in mind environmental footprint that uh, digitalization actually has and then what we are doing with it how we are reducing it or how we actually <laughs> deal with it. So in terms like we want to use digitalization to promote all other of our rights, but not to damage the nature. And <laughs> you know that we need uh, a lot of clouds, a lot of physical space where all those informations uh, from our communication, whether it is governmental, business, uh, civil sector, or anything else is held. So this is one level. And another level is what actually um, something a bit more related to what's happening on Balkans, because we have so many struggles here in terms of um, environmental justice and defending our environmental rights. And they're closely related how our governments, I'm con concretely referring to Serbia, is uh, damaging both our uh, economical, social, and environmental rights and use digital space to um, fuel um, hate and uh, hate speech and uh, social divides towards marginalized social groups um, of people with different identities, minorities, etc. So it's super complex. And I just want to have this uh, complexity of discussion, not just like we need to campaign, but we need to reflect a bit more deeper and be I mean, there are some uh, governments that uh, simply don't want to cooperate or are using civil society, like we have that in Serbia, for their own interest while they are violating our rights. So the question is how, how we approach that and how we actually use our digital space to organize, for example, against them and to mobilize people to defend their rights. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, there are very valid questions. Uh, anyone from uh, the audiences or from the speakers would like to address this further? Uh, how can we uh, expand our digital space? And um, especially in terms of protest, and how can we make ourselves heard? Uh, Anybody from uh, audiences or the speakers? Some if I I don't know. Ah, yeah, yeah, sure. So certainly, I think I can I can come in here. Uh -huh. Maria, you you raise a really important point about digital spaces being absolutely critical to civil society work, to solidarity, to the defense of our rights. One big challenge at the moment is that they are universally agreed fundamental rights and freedoms. There's a universal human rights framework. Unfortunately, governments are trying to undermine that framework. In fact, very compelling arguments are being made uh, against the universality of the rights framework by saying that, you know, by invoking cultural values or the need to develop with certain nationalist characteristics. So I think we ourselves need to oppose that very strongly. Uh, and, and in doing so, we also must you know, continue to, to, to push for better standards for respect for freedom of expression. And what are the limits under which governments can restrict digital rights? You know, we, have, we have a huge phenomenon of internet shutdown. So whenever governments are faced with public protests or with public criticisms, we often find that uh, the recourse oftentimes is to shut down the internet by many governments. And I think that's something that needs to be uh, opposed uh, very heavily. The second is, of course, 
the right to digital freedom is a human right. It's an emerging right. It allows us to, to, to communicate. And, and I think we really need to develop an area of work on digital rights or human rights. And they enable people to express their voices, to be part of the decisions that impact their lives and to ensure accountability of decision makers. And I think we all need to continue to push for that as the most important frontier uh, of of our of the exercise of civic freedoms because many of us due to pandemic related restrictions have actually been exercising our fundamental freedoms in the digital sphere and uh, and which has remained challenging as you so rightly highlighted. Very well, Sir Mandeep. Um, yes. Just now, um, I don't mind um, maybe trying to to respond very briefly to some of those points. I think Mandeep has done a great job on it, but. Um, Maybe just the issue of the, which the speaker, the participant from the floor spoke about, which was about the full range, you know, fighting for the full range of rights and economic and social being very important. I think there is a really um, important discussion going on at the moment within the human rights movement about the fact that perhaps to date there's been quite a focus on, you know, promoting and, and um, securing civil and political rights, which are extremely important, you know, the right to assembly and, and expression and so on, but there's been less focus on economic and social rights. And I think it's really important, and especially listening to some of the very inspiring um, speeches that were made today um, at the opening plenary of the uh, Global People's Assembly, we are in a moment when, you know, there's a lot of change and there is a real possibility for trying to change, um, not just and, and not just make advances, hopefully, um, in terms of, you know, the rights to freedom of expression and, and assembly and our, our um, civil and political rights generally, but also um, economic and social rights. You know, there's a huge amount, and I think the pandemic has just highlighted this, of social and economic inequality around the world, within countries and between countries, and there, you know, we, we have to push. Um, so our, in our work on, on trying to promote civic space, we're promoting civic space so that we can articulate better, you know, the full range of rights to which every citizen has a right to expect, you know, its government to, to um, work towards realizing. And so I think there is this um, very complicated relationship between uh, digital space, civic space, and then using that civic space to push for the you know, widest range of, of uh, human rights. And we know what they are, and especially the ones that have been maybe given lower priority to date, economic and social rights, and many would argue cultural rights. So I think that, you know, we are talking about, you know, um, improving digital rights, strengthening digital rights, as, as Mandeep already said, so that it can strengthen civic, the civic space we need. And through this, that's in using that civic space to promote the human rights agenda in the fullest sense possibly, which is all of the rights and not just some of them. So I hope that might answer one of the questions. And I very much take the point that was made about the environmental impact of um, you know, digitalization, there are real concerns, environmental concerns about data centers, for example, the amount of energy they use, about their carbon emissions and so on. So we do need to keep scrutinizing, you know, the process of digitalization and making sure that you know, the way in which it's done conforms with the kind of um, environmental justice and the environmental, you know, sort of uh, protection that we're talking about in many areas of our work. So um, that point was well made, I think. So thanks, Justin. Thank you, dear Jay. I see a hand raised uh, by uh, Matt from CPD. Matt, you have any question, concern? Please feel free to uh, address. Yes. Well, I have two questions. Um, thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot to Forrest, who really uh, did quite a lot of the heavy lifting and preparing for the preparing this event. Um, glad to see that there's fairly good participation. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask was basically to frame this in the context of the People's Assembly and kind of uh, uh, why we're meeting, which is, uh, I guess, on the, on the outskirts of the UN General Assembly um, and putting this conversation in the, the sort of context of the UN and world leaders meeting right now. And what um, we would say probably at, at, at an international level, um, has been some, um, I guess, positive developments on, on kind of how these institutions are approaching the, the issue of civic space and civil society 
Um, and I think we've seen this was sort of the culmination of this process. Mandeep, you'll know about this, the, uh, this guidance that was issued by the UN to its kind of, um, um, to its functioning kind of agencies and so on and how to work with civil society. Um, and that was sort of the, the fruits of a, a consultation that was undertaken, I guess, by the UN Development Group. Um, but essentially the, the sort of um, the severe gap that we see between kind of the trend of a more receptive kind of approach to civil society and then what's happening kind of in reality um, at the national level. And just trying to problematize that and think about what are we asking the UN and member states to do at this point where we see kind of, you know, I would say positive developments at, a, at an international level, but really no um, kind of leverage or power of the UN to, to um, you know, affect, affect uh, behavior change by governments and sort of other actors at the national level on the ground. So I'd be curious to hear where we go, where we go from here. We've, we've been fighting this battle really quite, quite for a long time at, at the international level and I think seen some progress and the progress isn't really reflected or mirrored um, you know, down to, to the, the national and local levels. And then my other question is a little bit more of a personal reflection basically on this, this, um, this digital space issue and the sort of difficulty um, that we'll have to, we have to confront, which is the manipulation of, of digital space by, I guess you would say, kind of um, by governments to, to, to push an agenda or to push a, um, uh, yeah, push a political agenda and sort of, I, you could say, even so division. Uh, and when we're thinking about the democratization of digital space, how we are going to confront this, um, it's really obviously a very new frontier. Um, and we see, you know, uh, very much in the, in the Western world, the uh, sort of digital frontier as being a place where you can really just sow division amongst a, a population and sort of this whole idea of um, creating false narratives through, through fake news, if you want to call it that. Um, basically confronting that in terms of our approaches to the democratization of the digital space and somehow the need to also um, make it safe I guess you would, I would say. So I'd be curious to hear how, um, especially those organizations that are working on, on the, the digitalization discussion in civic space, um, their reflections on that. Um, thanks a lot. Thanks, Matt. Um, so any uh, presenter uh, would like to address Matt's questions? Maybe Mandeep would like to start, and I don't mind following. Jessa? and I yep, know Mandeep. Mandeep, you what you would want to yeah, go, go ahead, please go ahead. I'll I'll come in after you. I've already spoken before. Okay, <laughs> Andre. <laughs> um, or maybe the other speaker would like to from um, CPDE would like to to take some of those points. Uh, I mean, I can, but I shared the sure, same. Please. <laughs> I share the same concerns of Matt, like uh, CPD uh, has been working quite extensively through the years on this uh, global level advocacy and uh, the question still stands, like how do we pressure the UN? And even uh, the a recent CPD uh, study was, that was conducted on uh, uh, how many countries have actually uh, allocated uh, budgets aligned with the SDGs and here is the question of the country commitment. For example, below 50% uh, of the study of the country case studies, which were, uh, uh, was found that they have allocated budgets to SDGs and even uh, uh, less than 60, uh, they have publicly available information on the SDG implementation. And this says a lot about the country commitment to, uh, with the UN and uh, goals and despite the positive developments on international level, for example, uh, in the UN, on the OECD or even the European Commission as a significant donor uh, towards promoting the, the civic space, let's say, uh, in practice, we see a huge uh, decline on how they approach and how they support the civic space and civil society organizations on the ground. So I can just reinforce the question, but I, yeah, I have no answer to this. Uh, 
Uh, the Mandeep, maybe you would want to say something, or DJ. Mandeep, okay. Mandeep. Or should I go? Do you want me to go ahead, Deirdre? Sure, I'll follow you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, I, I think one thing to keep in mind is that last year there was a UN guidance in civic space, which was uh, put together and uh, introduced by the Secretary General. Many civil society organizations took part in it, and it has three aspects of it. One is protection, protection of civil society activists and actors that are most at risk. Uh, participation, inclusion of civil society actors in decision making and in policy making circles, and the promotion of enabling laws and policies that uh, create uh, avenues for civil society participation and then and also in, uh, enable civil society to exercise its civic freedoms. I think we should continue to push for the adoption of the UN's guidance at all levels of the UN. Uh, I also just wanted to highlight that you know, the, the our Common Agenda report, which was uh, released by the UN Secretary General on 10th of September, uh, urges all UN agencies to set up civil society focal points in case they haven't done so already. I think we should continue to push for that. Uh, there was a long-standing civil society demand and continues to be a long-standing civil society demand for a uh, envoy for civil society, which can help ensure that you know, there's greater participation of civil society in, in various intergovernmental processes across the UN, that there's more consistency in how the UN engages, and the envoy can also be an important liaison point with uh, UN special experts that are tasked with uh, ensuring compliance of governments with respect to, you know, uh, commitments on civics, so civil society participation and civic freedom, like the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and Association, the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders, uh, Protection of Human Rights Defenders, the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. So I think we need to continue to push for better compliance uh, of, of the UN system uh, and, and also for the UN's uh, own infrastructure to, you know, to, to, to really urge governments to respect uh, civil society rights. Thanks, Mandeep. Uh, DRJ, would you like to... Take it forward. Yeah, I'll try and maybe and respond maybe in a more general way. I think Mandeep gave some very useful suggestions there. Um, for me, I suppose Matt, answering Matt some of Matt's questions because I think he raised quite a lot of points. But it seems seemed to for us when we decided to undertake this um, report that we produced on creating a more enabling digital environment for civil society that it was really um, because we recognised how fast the process of, of the digitalization was moving. Um, I think particularly um, intensified during the pandemic because we all found we had to migrate online. So there was a, a huge shift, I think even by people who didn't maybe use digital means as much as um, others did. So we realized that, you know, there's no option for civil society not to engage with this process of digitalization. You know, not all of us have been very um, engaged and it does seem to be a process that's largely driven by the private sector, by big tech companies at the moment, even governments, I think, are struggling to, to keep up and to develop the kind of regulatory or even um, legislative frameworks that will, you know, try to respond to some of the challenges presented by digitalization. So, I suppose that would be my starting point. There's no no choice for civil society, I think, unless we want the way that the digitalization happens to, to be driven by somebody else and, and in a way, perhaps, and in a direction that we're not uh, comfortable with and that does undermine and, and reduce our civic space. Um, I suppose then um, the second thing to say is, of course, that digitalization is full of risks as well as opportunities. And we made that very clear in our report. I think we very you know, um, gave a very detailed analysis of all of the risks that we see um, attached to, to uh, the process of digitalization for civil society and for society generally, but also the opportunities. And I suppose our conclusion was that there are as many opportunities as there are risks. So really, if civil society is going to engage, the challenge for it is to engage in a way that sort of maximizes the opportunities and that tries to mitigate the risks. And on its own, it's not going to succeed in doing that. So therefore, there's a big emphasis in our report on partnership, partnership with governments, with international organizations, but also with tech companies and with tech for good NGOs, because, you know, all of the people who are interested in an open, democratic, free internet and, you know, a form of digitalization that's going to promote democracy and human rights and so on, 
we need to work with them because there we know and um, the speaker from CPD has already mentioned there are very illiberal forces at work at the moment. And, you know, when we speak about digitalization, there are probably several approaches already existing to digitalization. Some governments would see um, the, you know, the, the need to heavily control um, you know, digital, the internet and, and uh, the form of, of sort of the kind of digital space, let's say, that, that citizens are, are hoping they will have access to. And we see that very often when, you know, elections happen and, and governments are nervous about outcomes and they shut down the internet and so on. So um, I suppose, again, I would say it's really important to look to, well, who's doing more progressive things with um, digitalization? And there is a uh, side event tomorrow, uh, an official UNGA side event that um, Forus's um, Danish member, Global Focus, it's the Danish uh, development platform, um, civil society um, platform in, in uh, Denmark. It is working with the Danish government to produce something called a Copenhagen Declaration, which is really a very clear declaration by the Danish government about how it understands um, digitalization and the role that digitalization can play in promoting democracy, human rights, um, and civic space worldwide. So, you know, what the, or the Danish government is trying to do is to get other governments to sign up to this, to sort of share, you know, and endorse this vision of the role that digitalization can play in creating a more, you know, a healthier, uh, a more open, a more a freer um, digital environment uh, for all citizens to enjoy. And, you know, so far it is encouraging. They do seem to have some support from other UN member states, the Costa Rican government and the, the Danish government, sorry, I should say, are spearheading heading this so there is a side event on that tomorrow and for me I think and for Forrest you know we've been looking I suppose with alarm at some of the illiberal trends that we see in the world at the moment governments you know shifting to the right and we see a lot of authoritarian responses and very repressive responses to civil society but I think the strength of of the sort of illiberal trends are going to really concentrate the minds of the UN system and those in it who do support this idea of an open, democratic, you know, free world. And perhaps that is going to be to civil society's advantage because I think the, the, um, the UN and, and, and governments generally will have to recognize the important role that civil society plays in holding open uh, civic space in actually, you know, um, in, in, in challenging some of the, the sort of illiberalism and the, the uh, intolerance and the um, extremism that we see uh, has emerged in, in, in you know, different parts of the world in recent years. So I think maybe the final thing I'll say is just that um, I think and, and, and Forrest is convinced that civil society has to play a role in shaping digitalization. It has to partner with other stakeholders, even stakeholders it hasn't partnered with before, including the private sector. And it has to partner with um, those who have the same progressive vision as it has. And we can be cynical about some, but even if governments and, and the UN system are doing this because they want to hold open, because they understand also that in, a, in an illiberal authoritarian world, business doesn't thrive because when borders aren't open and you know trade isn't open and free that it also jeopardizes you know um commerce and and international trade and so on so even if it is for those pragmatic reasons you know we believe that there are governments and there are international institutions that will work with civil society and perhaps support civil society more in this push for greater you know digital space and and civic space and uh, you know, a, a kind of space that promotes democracy and human rights. And it will be, I'd say, for the coming decade. I mean, Kumi Nadu said this morning in the opening plenary of this assembly that we're living in a really interesting time and that we can expect huge structural and systemic change in the next 10 years because of the instability that's there at the moment. But you know, I think it's important for civil society globally to align itself with progressive actors who are pushing in broadly the same direction if we want to achieve the kind of society, a global society that we're trying to create that's equal and just and open and, you know, equitable um, and not the one that maybe the more illiberal forces that are so evident um, at the moment are pushing towards, which would be a much more closed, nationalistic, even extremist um, societies that, 
you know, are discriminatory and that don't uh, value or promote human rights or civic space. So that's um, the last word on it. But I, I hope Matt feels that some of his, his points at least have been addressed. Thanks, Jasna. Thanks, JJ. Uh, we have um, a very valid uh, question uh, from, it's not a question, but it's a kind of concern about the role of multinational cooperation. I think this, uh, if you could read it, uh, Megan, uh, it's a very important uh, question. What is the role of um, multinational in the whole uh, issues of digitalization? And then I can see one hand raised from Ruminiga. Uh, would you want to ask any question? Or you want to share something? Oui, euh, je voulais poser une question par rapport euh, à la société civile et le gouvernement. Et ça, je vais parler dans le contexte africain et plus précisément dans le contexte des pays des Grands Lacs, où vraiment le gouvernement ne respecte pas les sociétés civiles, surtout avant, pendant et après les élections. Et aussi, euh, les actions de la société civile ne sont pas considérées et ne sont pas entendues dans, euh, dans la région des Grands Lacs. Nous, au niveau de notre organisation Beni Mbuto, nous sommes membres de Civicus, mais voilà, nous essayons de tout faire et voilà, d'élever, voilà, de, de construire une, une organisation, une, une, une société qui est vraiment plus inclusive, où il y a le respect de l'égalité, le respect des sexes entre l'homme et la femme, mais voilà, avec euh, la crise sanitaire. On n'a pas pu, avec le, avec le confinement répétitif, on a tout perdu. Les membres, on ne sait plus les récupérer. Et voilà, donc c'est un peu compliqué. Et voilà, par rapport à ça, qu'est-ce que vous nous conseillerez de faire par rapport à une telle situation pour pouvoir redonner une voix et voilà, une voix à la société civile qui souffrent, surtout dans des pays pauvres, où ce sont les populations qui, euh, qui font que le gouvernement fonctionne, qui est ce qui est le contraire par rapport aux autres pays, où euh, les pays, c'est eux qui supportent leur population, mais en Afrique, ce sont les populations qui font fonctionner le gouvernement. Qu'est-ce que vous en pensez? Est-ce que vous pouvez nous faire euh, au moins quelques, quelques pistes à suivre? Quoi? Merci. Uh, thank you so much. May, may I ask um, each presenter to just um, very briefly address this question, maybe in one minute each, please? Uh, we can start with Mandeep. Would you want to answer? Thanks, Jyotsna. And I also want to take on, uh, you know, Megan Maxwell has raised a really important question about the role of corporations. And I think that's really important for us, the civil society, to take into account. In fact, Corporate accountability is becoming a huge issue as collusion between political and economic elites, you know, leads to greater inequalities around the world. So I think uh, it's important that we don't just look at the harmful activities of extractive industries or the bad labor practice that the practices that exist on, in certain industries, but also look at how the tech sector uh, is, is, is causing, you know, the disinformation pandemic around the world. In fact, disinformation, there's a whole economy behind it. There's a lot of profit that's about that's behind it and how propaganda is, is, is promoted to gullible populations. So I think that's a really important uh, issue to look into because it has a lot of, it causes a lot of harm in societies. Just vaccine hesitancy is, is one aspect of, of disinformation. Apart from that, just to link with Michelle Ruminiga's question, how elections are oftentimes uh, you, uh, you know, undermined uh, through disinformation campaigns and, and how people are also sometimes uh, you know, um, uh, induced into uh, supporting hate-filled agendas that exclude certain minority populations and, and, uh, and, and others. Uh, and I think that's something that we, we really need to be much more aware of and, and we need to continue to highlight and fight against because it's not just the state it's not just the state you know state actors who civil society has traditionally uh, uh, you know sought to ensure accountability of but private actors now have a lot of power and we need to continue to ensure their accountability on michelle's question yes michelle it's, it is a serious issue because 
uh, in, especially in one party states or in countries where there are authoritarian leaders who, you know, who, who of course want to prolong their stay in power as we've seen in West Africa. There's been coups recently. There's also been the issue of uh, political leaders extending their stay in office by amending constitutional term limits. And it remains a major challenge and civil society's role is so critical because to ensure free and fair elections. And here I think we, we must make a common cause with regional and international bodies to help work with them to monitor elections and to, and to ensure that it's not just on the day of the election that, that we need to have, you know, that, that there's electoral integrity on, on, on how votes are cast, but it's also the, the conditions before the election that are absolutely critical that in, that enable uh, a political process to be run with integrity. So I think that's a really important point that you raise. And I think as, as civil society, we also need to engage in, you know, go in, in more, put more emphasis on democratic values, which are being eroded at the moment. Thank you, Mandeep. Um, can I move to Biliana? You want to address both the questions? Uh, yes, uh, without, uh, well, well, without repeating too much uh, with Mandeep, I can maybe just share the reflections from the Balkans. Uh, in the past few years, in the past couple of years, uh, I think it was very effective that civil society organizations have worked, have worked a lot with uh, activists and also have found ways to engage the citizens on the digital, uh, digital space. So mobilizing uh, citizen support for raising the issue uh, because uh, we, I think we started pretending that gov the governments are listening even uh, with the fact that we are operating in much less restrictive environment than the, the, the colleagues in the Africa, in Africa. But uh, this has worked a lot because public pressure has been quite visible. So the government had to respond on very concrete issues. And the second one is, uh, yes, the power of putting international pressure. So in our context, uh, the putting pressure from the EU has worked quite well uh, so far on our governments because the EU integration process, for example, has held a lot of leverage, but also other international actors have been involved and uh, sort of narrowing down the international pressure on governments have made them uh, made some changes uh, when uh, coming from the civil society. So just to, on the to those two specific aspects. Thank you, Biliana. Deirdre, would you want to address one of the questions um, or both? Well, maybe just very briefly, Please. because I, I yeah. think I've said a lot already um, just now, but um, on the question of, um, you know, Ghana and, and I think Mandeep has, has answered that in a way and important pointed out the importance of election monitoring and that, you know, kind of cooperating more on this at the global level and making sure that elections are free and fair. But I suppose also looking at maybe um, encouraging international um, organizations, international banks and investors and so on to, um, to factor in, you know, as almost like an investment criteria, whether um, uh, the digital um, environment, digital space in a country is open and um, unobstructed, because um, it is true that, you know, the, the sort of frequency with which we're seeing the internet being abused around times of elections and so on, and, and working very much against civil society is not um, acceptable. So there's many ways in which we can work. And I think um, one of the ways is to, to um, to try to convince those who are investing in these countries also to include um, the issue of, you know, um, open and, and, and free sort of digital environment as a, an investment criterion. Of course, we have to persuade the investors of that. And that kind of gets on to the last point about the private sector. I suppose, again, um, you know, civil society perhaps traditionally has had, a, you know, very cautious approach to the private sector. And it is true that the private sector in many ways is a different animal from uh, civil society it is self-interested and profit seeking usually but you know it's not to say that there haven't been examples where the private sector for when you know it can be convinced that it has common cause with civil society and something can work with civil society and can you know achieve um a lot of of uh, you know things that civil society on its own if we're trying to um 
you know, persuade governments of something wouldn't always be successful at. So I suppose what I'm saying is I think we should be very um, discriminating about the private sector. We should start to identify those that have. And I think a lot of companies are trying to improve their their um, corporate social responsibility profile. And some of, it do, some of them doing it quite cynically, but others really genuinely making an attempt. So I think we should try to uh, discriminate between those that are making a real effort and those that don't seem to be and to to at least see what we can agree even in a pragmatic way when it comes to trying to promote this uh, you know civic space uh, human rights and a more enabling digital environment because if we don't work with the big tech companies i think if we can't find some way of working with them then we won't achieve the kind of um, outcomes that we're looking for thanks Thank you, dear Jane. So with this, we have almost reached the end. And, and if you still have questions and concerns, you can uh, still write to the organizers and they can write to you or they can address the questions. Um, now, uh, for yes, me- no, Sorry sorry to interrupt. I just wanted just to add a small thing uh, well, for yeah, Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, I will speak in French if that's okay, just to practice. Uh, <laughs> The language is not in Italian, although it would be easier. Uh, bonjour, Michel, ou bonsoir. <laughs> oui, c'était en fait juste pour vous dire que aussi pour un réseau uh, international comme Forus, c'était un énorme challenge, celui de continuer à rejoindre les communautés, surtout celles qui ne sont pas connectées, parce qu'évidemment, maintenant, on ne peut pas se voir tête à tête, on ne peut pas créer euh, des liens, euh, disons, naturels, si on veut les appeler comme ça. Du coup, euh, quelque chose qui nous a aidé beaucoup, c'était de mettre en place des groupes de travail, si on peut les appeler comme ça, avec les membres, et d'essayer vraiment de parler tous ensemble sur ces gros challenges. On a organisé un COVID task force, par exemple, pendant dans euh, la crise, etc. Et on continue vraiment à parler de façon très honnête euh, de la grosse difficulté maintenant de continuer à, à garder un réseau en vie, euh, même si on ne peut pas se voir, même si beaucoup de gens ne sont pas connectés. Et surtout, euh, ça nous rappelle du euh, problème pour la société civile euh, des capacités digitales. En fait, c'est on a un, un gros gap. On est habitué à se parler, à créer des groupes comme ça, même dans la rue, etc. Du coup, c'est malheureusement on doit faire face à cette réalité et de nous dire il faut qu'on investisse dans les digital, il faut qu'on ait des euh, conversations honnêtes avec nos membres par rapport à ça et euh, il faut qu'on soit solidaire les uns avec les autres euh, pour essayer quand même de garder la positivité et ces réseaux de la société civile en vie, qui, comme vous avez dit, sont extrêmement importants dans tous les contextes et surtout dans des contextes où euh, c'est plus difficile de s'exprimer et de créer des liens. Voilà, c'est juste euh, comme ça, un commentaire de solidarité euh, pour vous. Thank you so much, Bibi. And uh, with this, we are almost, we are uh, at the end of the uh, deliberation because the next session is going to start Soon after this, uh, it's very difficult for me to uh, to uh, summarize everything. But we heard from our uh, you know our uh, colleagues uh, uh, from uh, from uh, Civicals, from Balkans, and from Porus. Uh, you know we have seen how the CSOs are still uh, you know working on the mobilization. How despite all those uh, challenges, the mobilization is still is continuing. You know we are working for the environmental justice. Uh, we are working for the civic freedom. We are working for the peaceful assembly. And then uh, we heard from the Balkans. We had uh, how you know how we need to still connect with our our citizens, um, especially uh, you know on the issues of digital illiteracy and uh, also on the issues of uh, lack of regulations. Uh, and also we need to address the issues of uh, you know fake news because it's definitely impacting the civil society. And um, the role of donors and partners are very important. We need to and then we have to create our space or spaces on the digital right. And obviously it's one of those very important human rights. So let's not um, uh, try to shy uh, from uh, not knowing more about the digitalization. We have civil, our civil society. We are now, I think we have, we, we have become skilled in last one year, especially during the time of pandemic. So let's keep working, let's uh, you know, keep raising our voices in solidarity. 
and um, let's give some time to government. We let's keep asking, questioning the UN, the role of government and the UN. How do we expect some behavioral changes from them? And of course, where do we go from here? So with this, I am uh, I'm trying to, I'm closing this uh, very important session. And thank you again for us, CPD, Civicus, and all the participants for your time. And uh, we'll keep seeing you during this General Assembly. So thank you. Keep Thanks healthy everyone. and happy. Bye bye. For um, those of you everything. that are here for the gender event, just rejoin using the same link and we'll get you admitted once we've done all our technical checks. And I would also just like to thank all of our translators who have helped make this session very accessible for everyone. So thank you to them as well. Thank you, Thanks, Rose. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, bye Justna. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, everybody. Bye. -bye. Thanks.